Hi, I'm Tom O'Connell with the Eastside Freedom Library. Welcome to the sixth conversation in our series, Learning from the Past, Fighting for the Future. Our guest today is Barbara Fries. She's the author of Industrial Strength and Now, Eight Stories of Corporations Defending the Indefensible from the Slave Trade to Climate Change. Fries first confronted corporate denial years ago when cross-examining industry witnesses from coal who were disputing the science of climate change. Her book takes the reader through eight campaigns of corporate denial from the slave trade to radium consumption, financial manipulation on Wall Street, to climate change. At a time when corporate abuses too often go unchallenged, Freeze's powerful stories equip citizens with the understanding we need to hold corporations accountable in the future. Barbara Freeze is an environmental attorney and a former uh, Minnesota uh, assistant attorney excuse me, general. Her interest in corporate denial was sparked by cross-examining coal industry witnesses who were disputing science of climate change. Barbara Fries is also the author of Coal, A Human History, which was designated by the New York Times as a notable book in 2003. And best of all, she lives in St. Paul, Minnesota. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for having me. Great. Well, thanks for being here. So why don't we start just a little bit about your background and how you came to write this great book? Oh, thanks. Well, um, sure. Uh, as you said, I was a, an assistant attorney general here in Minnesota. I've been uh, I'm a Minnesota native and um, after law school, came back to Minnesota, started working at the attorney general's office. My job there was <clears throat> to represent the pollution control agency. So I was mm -hmm. doing environmental enforcement mm -hmm. um, and I found myself cross-examining the coal industry witnesses because we had a proceeding here in Minnesota in the mid 90s where we were trying to uh, estimate the environmental costs of generating electricity. Hmm. So we looked at coal and mm -hmm. the coal industry didn't like that and they, <laughs> they flew here and brought in scientific witnesses who testified that we didn't have to worry about climate change and it wasn't going to happen and besides mm -hmm. we were going to like it and it got... Um, so they, they had their scientists. That, they had they had scientists. Now these were not people who worked directly for the coal industry. They were, mm -hmm. you know, generally had other jobs, but were uh -huh. brought in and paid by the coal industry for this uh -huh. testimony. Uh -huh. So that kind of was my first introduction, both to coal, the subject of my first book, mm -hmm. and to corporate denial, now the subject of my second book. Okay. After that proceeding, I went on and did a lot of work in the nonprofit sector, trying mm -hmm. to promote clean energy policies and climate policies and, and combat um, greenhouse gas pollution and saw the climate denial I had seen starting with the coal industry spreading mm -hmm. through society in mm -hmm. ways that I thought were really alarming and mm -hmm. astonishing. And, um, you know, I have to admit that, that on a, a somewhat uncharitable level, I was looking at these people and just thinking, what is wrong with these people? And, <laughs> and trying to understand what was going on in their minds. Yeah. At the same time, I was looking at this as a social phenomenon and how it had, and, and wondered just historically, how had it affected society in the past? How, how dangerous had it been? How had societies confronted it? And if they mm -hmm. had overcome it, how had they overcome it? Um, because, you know, I think this is, while, while it is a, a phenomenally dangerous time in terms of industrial mm -hmm. denial, industrial denial itself has been around for a very long time. Yeah, that's one of the things about your book. You go all the way back to the slave trade and maybe you could go further. What are the, you, you write stories, case studies, and then kind of weave in um, some of your learning uh, about the processes of denial, psychological, sociological, kind of to help us understand beyond the particular case. What, but the stories are great, they're compelling, sometimes they're infuriating. What, what, were you, what are the eight uh, case studies that you look at? Right, so the eight studies, I start with the British slave trade. Um, and I use the British one because the British dominated the slave trade mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Uh, and there was a, a strong abolition movement there. Uh, of course, the British people knew next to nothing about what was really going on. So the industry was able to offer all kinds of denials and, and they took advantage of that opportunity. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I start with that. I, I go up to the radium industry in the US in the early 20th century mm -hmm. and the denials around that. I move on to auto safety and yeah. the auto industry's denials around whether they had any responsibility at all for making cars crash worthy. Mm -hmm. Is this where um, Ralph Nader kind of came on the scene? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then I uh, talk about leaded gasoline and mm. the controversies around that back to the 1920s and then again mm. in the 60s and in the more modern era. Mm. Um, then I talk about ozone depletion and chlorofluorocarbons and the mm. denials around that. Mm -hmm. I have a chapter on the tobacco industry, of course, because yeah. you have to talk about the tobacco industry. Uh, um, as you noted, I, I also dip into the financial industry and have a mm. chapter about the the behavior and the denials that led to the Great Recession mm -hmm. and the co virtual collapse of the global econo economic system. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I end with a chapter on climate change, of course, mm -hmm. ending where I began. Mm -hmm. Now, as you were picking your uh, case studies, your stories, um, did you have other ones you thought about and, and either said, you know, this book will be an encyclopedia if I don't stop, or um, for some reason, were less compelling. Could you write another book with eight more stories? Um, I, I could. Not it would I'm probably suggesting. take years to research, as this one did. Yeah. Um, sure, there were lots of industries. I mean, I thought about, should I do uh, leaded paint? Mm. Because I was doing leaded gas, I thought, ah, too much lead. Yeah. Um, I could have done asbestos, I think. I mean, there mm. are certainly a lot of historical cases of denial, but um, I ended up picking a selection that I thought would span a lot of subjects and yes. all of which were hugely impactful, either threatening global mm -hmm. catastrophe uh, to mm -hmm. the environment or harming millions of people. The radium is perhaps one ex um, exception to that because that really only hurt maybe thousands of people. Um, and you know, I wanted ones where the denial was very much in public because it, you know, if you have a long campaign of public denial, it really influences how the public thinks about truth and mm -hmm. what we should, you know, who are the authorities? How do mm -hmm. we in, understand truth? Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up, you know, narrowing it. And uh, well, and also to be clear, I picked industries, purposely picked industries where the harm was so obvious, mm -hmm. at least to the modern reader, that right. I didn't yeah. have to spend time saying, you know, tobacco actually does cause cancer. Yeah, right, <laughs> I could just exactly. plunge right into the denials and yeah, exactly. didn't worry, have to worry that I was, you know, yeah. skipping some important background for people. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the, the first one I want to I, I could, uh, ask you about all of them in, in detail. I, I, I did want to start with radium, partly because that was really new to me. Um, it, it's not, I think, something that a lot of generally people thought about. Uh, what was what was that all about? The radium. Yeah, you know? that was new to me too, pretty much. Um, so so radium was discovered by the Curies, mm, uh, yes. Marie and Pierre Curie in the in mm. the late 1800s. It was phenomenally radioactive, and mm. they knew that, and it burned your flesh. That they knew that as well. I mean, yeah, those were yeah. like sort of the only couple of things they knew, and and there was this aura of of mystery around it. Mm. it people just didn't understand radioactivity, and they certainly didn't understand this new element and. And a lot of people like say Thomas Edison mm. said, I am not gonna monkey with this stuff. Yeah. This is too dangerous. We need yeah. to know a lot more before yeah. we do experiments. Yeah. Um, but that did not stop this new industry from emerging in the United States to promote mm. uh, radium. And, and it really took two different directions. On the one hand, there was this company called Standard Chemical and, and then a couple of others later uh, founded to refine radium and to sell it as a cure-all. It was the basis of a health fad. And mm. uh, in 1913, this company opened up a clinic, a free clinic in Pittsburgh, where mm. people would go in. And they weren't using radium the way legitimate doctors were, which was to put it next to a cancerous tumor for a while, and then mm. that tumor might shrink. That was a legitimate medical use. Yeah. But for the industry, that you know, th that use, you would reuse the same radium all the time. That was not a good business model if you yeah. wanted to yeah. sell a lot of radium. Yeah. So instead, Standard Chemical in its clinic, they would have people come in, thousands of people would mm. come in, and they would have radium injected into their veins, they would drink radium, mm. they would breathe radioactive gases, and they were told that they were being treated for virtually anything you can think mm. of, everything from cancer to tuberculosis to mm. insanity to mm. um, anemia, which mm. ironically is something that 
radium actually causes. Mm. Um, and, and this then became the basis of a health fad. Lots of new products emerged. People could buy their little bottles of radium drink and drink them at home. Um, they started putting radium into bath salts. They would sell it as pills. They mm. would sell it as all kinds of products that were just phenomenally dangerous. And, and yeah. it was seen as a health fad. And it took a while to realize that it was actually killing people. Yeah. Yeah. The second part of that, in that industry was... Uh, the, the radium paint, which people are a little bit more familiar with, I mm -hmm. think. They, they put radium in paint so the paint would glow in the dark. Mm -hmm. The glow in the dark paint you could put on watch dials, and, mm -hmm. and it was a very useful product. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Unfortunately, they hired young women, really girls, maybe mm -hmm. 15 years old, uh, to paint the watch dials, and they mm -hmm. taught them to, to put their paintbrushes to their lips to make a nice little point. Mm -hmm. So, of course, these young women ingested lots mm -hmm. of radium. Mm -hmm. uh, they were told it was healthy. And of course, mm -hmm. that made sense because mm -hmm. it was being sold as a health product. Mm -hmm. They were told it would put a glow in their cheeks. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, for many of them, what happened was their teeth started to fall out mm -hmm. and then their jaws started to rot. And sometimes their jaws would mm -hmm. have to be removed. And many of them, not all of them, but many of them died very gruesome deaths, mm -hmm. uh, which were in the headlines. And, and they became the subject of a lot of sympathy. Eventually, the industry continued, but it said, OK, don't stick that stuff in your mouth. <laughs> we'll figure yeah. out another way to do right. this. Um, but, but there were lots of denials around that, yeah. certainly for the industry that, that was founding this as a, as a health fad, mm -hmm. you know, they were taking advantage of the fact that, that there was a lot of energy coming from radium, right? Mm -hmm. And there was this aura of mystery and kind of wizardry and people thought, well, energy is good. <laughs> you know, energy yeah, you're right. We all and yeah. they just took advantage of the fact that people did not understand this, that at one point, Standard Chemical had hired this doctor, gave him a few weeks of training and sent him out to, to try to lecture about radium to other doctors. And, and he said to the president, what if they ask me questions? These professors, I'm sunk. Mm. And, this, and the president said, uh, the president of Standard Com Chemical said to them, answer them any way you choose. You know more than any of these other people do. Mm. And so then they started their own. They started mm. their own clinic. They actually started their own medical journal, which they put in articles about how great this was and mm -hmm. sent it for free to all the doctors. Mm. And they basically dominated the science. And that's one way that that industries one, can do yeah. this. But so if I had to say, you know, what are they denying? Well, they're denying the fundamental danger. Yeah, and they're yeah. denying the fact that they should have evidence of safety before they start injecting it into mm. people's veins. So um, what what was it that eventually and how long did it take to um to eliminate or at least uh, regulate uh, radium? Well, when it came to the, um, this health fad, mm -hmm. uh, that continued, well, let me back up. The, the radium girls, the, the women who were mm -hmm. painting yeah. the dials, they, yeah. they sort of hit the headlines in the mid twenties in, in New York um, and got a lot of attention. And yet somehow that did not seem to put an end to the idea of, of consuming radium as a health product, it, it, it just yeah. didn't connect to people. But in the 30s, um, a very rich industrialist who had bought lots of these little radium drinks and, and had enough money to poison himself very thoroughly, mm. uh, managed to find himself in the headlines because he started dying, his own gruesome oh. death, yeah. his jaw falling apart, I mean, holes in his, I mean, yeah. bad, bad stuff. And that also hit the headlines. And, and I think that publicity would basically saying, hey, it's not just poor women working mm -hmm. in the factories who are mm -hmm. dying, but rich men who yeah. are dying. Yeah. Uh, I think that really helped. The government had been a little bit involved in terms mm -hmm. of trying to look at their um, uh, marketing, for false advertising, but there really wasn't much federal authority yet. So mm -hmm. that was largely an industry that kind of faded away because of bad publicity. Okay. So if I'm a, an executive or a founder or promoter of radium back then, um, and I start seeing, you know, uh, young girls' uh, faces fall apart, it seems, it seems like particularly gruesome symptoms. Um, what would it take actually for me to say, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't be doing this? Yeah. Well, we, we don't know from history because, you know, mm -hmm. they, they, what, what happens, what happened was they got sued. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. there was enough litigation that they settled without really giving much to the victims or their families. Yeah. Yeah. And then they eventually sort of figured out yeah. new ways to, to approach it. So lots of bad publicity and lawsuits are a big yeah. part of it. Okay. I should say that one of the more appalling denials that came from the, the, the companies that were hiring young girls to paint on the radium mm -hmm. was that they had in their generosity 
uh, because the work was such light work, they had hired a lot of cripples and other mm. unhealthy young women. And when their diseases progressed naturally, the poor company was unfairly blamed for its mm. generosity, which, yeah. <laughs> you know, when you think about the fact that their facial bones were dissolving, which is yeah. not exactly a, a common ailment, it's yeah. just astonishing. Plus, by this time, they knew these young women had radioactive breath. There was no question about uh, the fact that they had consumed a lot of radium. Oh, boy. Yeah. Well, so another one uh, of your chapters was on tobacco. And on the one hand, it's fairly recent. And, you know, uh, many of us have kind of lived through that. Um, and yet I found uh, a new, a new information, or at least a new, new perspective on it. Was there anything surprising or new? What, what were some lessons? Um, yeah. for us to think about with the whole well, tobacco thing. Yeah, I mean, the, the tobacco industry, I think what maybe surprised me was just the wide variety of denials. It's like mm -hmm. they, they just had every arrow in their quiver and they used mm -hmm. them and they kept it going for so long. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, it started out with just saying it's not proven. And, and, you know, it was kind of funny because every decade I have quotes from like the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, they would say, if we really knew this was harming our customers, we would stop selling it. They claimed mm. that this as, as a moral stance, yes. they mm. would not sell it. In the 90s, suddenly you finally have executives saying, yeah, we'd still sell it. Yes. Uh, you also have executives saying, actually, as long as it's legal, we have no choice but to sell it. And uh -huh. then now we're to the point where they, they have been forced to accept the basic science of danger and addiction. Um, but of course, they remain enthusiastic about selling it to the extent that the law allows. So, mm -hmm. you know, obviously there is that that burden of proof issue and, and recognizing, you know, burden of proof is this sort of wonky legalistic term. Mm -hmm. But what it basically means is that you if you put the burden of proof on the other side, you get the benefit of every single doubt. And that means you have a strong incentive to manufacture doubt. Mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and of course, that's what the industry did. They pointed to other causes of cancer. They argued that maybe it was a, a constitutional thing, which is to say that the, the, the smokers, there was something in the constitution of smokers mm -hmm. that both made them want to smoke and made mm -hmm. them get lung cancer. Because yeah, yeah. without that, I mean, the, the statistical correlation between smoking and lung cancer was like so strong that it mm -hmm. would be a million to one that it was by random. Mm -hmm. So they needed an, an external cause. So they basically, you know, were trying to point to genetics, point to personality. Um, they used front groups to write these articles and put out these kind of bizarre theories. Like mm -hmm. one of them, one article was that um, maybe the, the lung cancer epidemic, which people really were troubled by in the 50s and 60s, was caused by the rising divorce rate, which caused sexual frustration, which caused mm. lung cancer. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, I yeah. mean, pretty bizarre stuff. Um, I was kind of astonished by the number of counterfactuals that, and I think this is how the mm. tobacco executives would would tell, would think about it themselves. They would be saying, in fact, I begin the, the book with a quote from the head of Philip Morris, former head of Philip Morris saying, who knows what you would do if you didn't smoke? You might beat your wife. You might drive cars fast. We don't know what the hell you oh, do. Oh, yeah, right. Um, and other executives later in the book quoting about how, well, you know, people need things, need drugs to get through life. And if mm -hmm. you didn't smoke, you might, you know, this is better than crack. Mm -hmm. um, so, so sort of imagining what, mm -hmm. how, how much worse the world would be without their product. That that's an easy thing to do, I think, for anybody who wants to try. We to all do bad product. things, and if you weren't smoking cigarettes, you'd be doing something else. You'd be doing something even worse. And even worse. Even more society. dangerous. Yeah. I was kind of astonished at how much they tried to just minimize the risk. And, and you know, the thing is risk is a really hard concept. I mean, in, in our own lives every day, you know, how, how risky is it to go to the grocery store during a pandemic? Well, yeah, if I really. wear my mask yeah. and, you know, we, we don't really yeah. have a clear objective yeah. assessment of risk. It varies how, depending on how we're feeling. And it means that it's easy to manipulate us. And so the industry talked about how, you know, the risks are really no big deal. Again, they would hire people to write articles saying, that not smoking on risk grounds would be like not kissing somebody because mouths have germs or not owning a dog or yeah, not yeah. crossing the street or, yeah. you know, and other products are dangerous. Applesauce is dangerous if you mm. get too much of it. And, mm. uh, you know, and, and as for that addiction, this is no more addiction than no more addictive than Twinkies or, yeah. or gummy bears. Yeah. So, so manipulating this notion of risk was very commonly done. What one thing they did a lot of course was, 
you know, a form of victim blaming by basically sure. saying, hey, smokers, no, we, it's on the package. Right? Right. So they, they actually uh, publicly opposed putting warnings on cigarette packages. Privately, they were happy because it gave them an argument in court mm. that smokers knew the dangers, they assumed the risk. And, mm. and after all, this is all about personal responsibility, oh, yeah. um, which is one of the things that made it particularly bizarre when they said, hey, as long as it's legal, we have no choice but to sell it. Oh, boy. So this, <laughs> um, this burden of proof uh, idea, which you come, uh, which is kind of threaded through your book, is that a legal Thing that here in the United States, um, it's a consumer or the community that has a burden of proof, or, or is how does it keep getting shifted? Is that just a yeah. matter of corporate? Agility well, or what? it 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 varies by law and by subject, right? Oh, okay. So, I mean, it, in a court of law, the burden of proof is a very formal concept. In fact, very often when you get to trial, the first thing you have in your briefs, I mean, before, mm -hmm. after the trial, when you're briefing, the first thing you fight about is who has the burden of proof and how heavy is that burden? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's an incredibly important concept. It gets applied in these public debates with less formality, of course, and mm -hmm. depending, uh, and what the law says is one thing, what actually gets applied in the court of public opinion and, and policy making is different. And we have seen the burden of proof being put on the critics of every industry. Mm. You know, certainly since the 1920s, the, the um, leaded gasoline industry did it, the tobacco industry did it extremely mm. well. And now we see the fossil fuel industry doing it. it. It is a remarkably successful strategy. And it's always driven me crazy because it, it <laughs> you know, one thing that lawyers do, I mean, you, you have certain situations where once you have enough evidence, the burden of proof shifts to the other side. So for example, if you're trying to prove somebody killed someone and, and you're the prosecutor and you've presented evidence that they, they actually committed the murder, and then they want to say, okay, well, I, I was insane. <laughs> they, so then the burden of proof shifts to them to prove that they were insane. But when it comes to a lot of these issues, especially climate change, we've had mountains of data collected over decades and you still have the industry and the groups that they fund mm. um, acting as if they have no burden to prove safety. It's always the burden on those who are concerned about the product or the pollutant who have to prove danger. And mm -hmm. um, of course that is a recipe for stalemate because you're never gonna get 100% no. certainty from you know every single person on the planet. And it doesn't take many to, to suggest that there is enough of a dispute to take all the urgency away from the situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let, let's move on to uh, the financial, the Wall Street um, and, and banking, the financial crisis of 20, 20, um, 2008, although it, was happening throughout the yeah, 2000s. Yeah. That's not one corporation or even, what well, is, it is one industry though, connected with financial. Yeah, and, and in really in all of these cases, I'm looking at, at you know, yeah. multiple corporations within an industry. Right, within yeah. the financial sector, when you think about the financial crisis, there were sort of two big segments to this industry. One was these new mortgage lending companies, not the banks and, and savings and loans that used to give mortgages, but new mm -hmm. companies that existed mm -hmm for the purpose of, of um, selling mortgages. And they focused really on the least sophisticated lenders and they had the most predatory practices mm -hmm. going after people uh, often using fraud and selling to folks these subprime mortgages with very high interest rates, often hidden, ballooning later. Um, what does subprime reason, mean? It means um, less than the ideal mortgage? Or the yes, exactly. So people who have bad credit Mm -hmm. um, who could not qualify mm -hmm. for a better mortgage with a lower interest rate lower, and okay. safer terms mm -hmm. would get these more dangerous mortgages. Mm -hmm. Some of these people could have qualified for better mortgages, but they didn't know it because mm -hmm. they were subjected to very aggressive sales. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason the industry did that and the reason that that, I mean, that, that's not a very good business model, selling, no. <laughs> selling mortgages to people who can't pay them back, yeah. unless you sell that product on to somebody else and they sold them back, they sold them on to Wall Street. Wow. And there's one anecdote I've got in the book that I took from a, a book that Mike Hudson wrote. Um, and the anecdote involves Lehman Brothers where they sent their vice president, Lehman Brothers major Wall Street investment mm -hmm. firm that went bankrupt, yeah. the biggest bankrupt, bankruptcy in history. Yeah. Um, they Before that, they sent their vice president to one of these new mortgage lenders 
Um, and the vice president wrote back to Lehman Brothers and said, this is a check your ethics at the door sweatshop of mm. people, you know, who are putting high pressure sales on vulnerable mm -hmm. people. Well, instead of then deciding not to partner with this company, Lehman Brothers <laughs> wrote back and said, we enthusiastically yes. welcome uh, <laughs> we're the looking for. opportunity yeah. to partner. Yes, this is yeah. apparently exactly what they were looking for. Yeah. And, and so what was going on was that Wall Street firms were buying these mortgages from the lenders and then they would sort of package them all mm -hmm. together and then they would take them to the ratings agencies and argue that hey these are no longer as risky as they look because mm -hmm. not everybody's going to default at once mm -hmm. um, and then the ratings agencies would be told that if they didn't give it a good triple a rating mm -hmm. that they would the, the wall street firm would take its business to another ratings agency mm -hmm. so they were essentially totally corrupted into this process yeah. and then the wall street would sell these products that looked safe mm -hmm. to the investment community mm -hmm. so that was sort of this chain of toxic debt that went yeah. through and and there was obviously a lot of denial along the way one was the denial that the housing bubble would ever burst because yeah. once yeah. housing prices stopped climbing, mm. all of these mortgages would, would become uh, untenable. People couldn't refinance anymore. Um, I've got a quote from the head of JP Morgan saying, somehow we just missed that housing prices don't rise forever. Mm. Um, you know, we, we, you might say that he, he surely couldn't have missed that, but, but that was the, mm -hmm. the yeah. justification he offered after the fact. Mm. Um, you had denial around the, the notion that you could take risky mortgages and magically convert them into safe investment products. Mm. Um, and, and I think one of the most important areas of denial was just around whether this industry could be trusted to regulate itself. I mean, you, you, you had the industry in Washington saying, do not regulate these exotic new investment products, mm -hmm. these derivatives. Don't do mm -hmm. that because the market's you know, the best way to do it and we can regulate ourselves because we know how to control risk. Mm -hmm. And they also went to Congress and, and they said, get rid of those old depression era rules that have mm -hmm. kept our industry behaving pretty safely for the last mm -hmm. few decades mm -hmm. and let us really get out there and compete. And, and mm -hmm. those old rules were removed uh, and, and this behavior happened. And, and then we ended up with the crisis that, you yeah. know, because obviously eventually the bill did come due. And, and by then the risk had been spread so far and wide uh, thanks to these investment products that spread the risk while hiding the risk mm -hmm. that nobody knew where it was. And that there was a crisis of confidence mm -hmm. and, a, and a crisis that affected millions and millions mm -hmm. of people. This of all the chapters made me the maddest. Um, there was plenty to be angry about, I suppose, or at least indignant. And, and one of the things was, um, and I remember at the time, um, these young, smart kids who got into Ivy League schools, kind of like the best and the brightest, and then got recruited to these jobs on Wall Street um, selling this stuff and, and buying their yachts and competing. And I thought, what an incredible moral breakdown that was. Um, I just wanted to go punch them out. You know, you got this great opportunity. Um, and what are you doing with it? You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was a funny kind of, parallel between the people who were hired by the mortgage lending companies who were often folks with high school educations who wouldn't have many economic opportunities but got into this business and would be selling loans in this really predatory way and then the the ivy league graduates who got hoovered up by wall street and paid lots of money mm -hmm. but in both cases things there were parallels they were in both cases subject to constant threat of being fired enormous uh -huh. pressure to keep uh, selling, yeah. selling, 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 yeah. um, and also incredible time pressure. They'd be isolated from other people so that you didn't have interference from families and, and whatnot. And you'd mm. be told that, you know, money was what this was all about. Mm. And, you know, they, they did sort of become this real case study in how in moral breakdown in, mm -hmm. and in moral yeah. denial in mm -hmm. this notion that you can still be a good person, even though this is what you are doing to mm -hmm. other individuals and to the system as a whole. Right. I remember at the time um, there was some revisiting of, of, of Adam Smith and that the idea that the whole point, any, anything goes in a capitalist system, um, the goal is to maximize uh, profit. And no one, you know, the, the, the very idea of morality, the, the heart of your book, the idea of social consequences 
um, really are um, irrelevant. Uh, I didn't know if that was a form of denial. I mean, it's sort of, you know, whatever goes is fine because the ultimate aim is to make money. Uh, yeah, well, I think it is. I mean, I, I use the term denial very broadly right, in my yeah. book. So I include yeah. outright lies. I include yeah. the more psychological traits of being in denial. And I mm -hmm. include, you know, basic rationalizations and ideology is certainly something that can support all kinds of, of self-interested, yeah. motivated reasoning, right? Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah, yeah, you can go back to Adam Smith and the invisible hand telling you that um, you don't have to worry about whether you're doing the right thing for society because the, in, the market itself will convert mm -hmm. your pursuit of self-interest into social into benefits, social. and yeah. often it does under mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. many circumstances. Um, but then we saw around 1970, sort of Milton Friedman coming forward, very influential uh, article that that he wrote talking about how you know you, you really shouldn't be listening to these uh, CEOs who say that they're pursuing social responsibility because the only legitimate goal of a corporation is to maximize shareholder profits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then we saw an even more sort of virulent strain of, of kind of libertarian market fundamentalism mm -hmm. coming in with the, the Koch brothers, Koch brothers and, mm -hmm. and, and starting really even in the 80s and, and really picking up in the 90s. And that, of course, is, is a theme that runs throughout my book because mm -hmm. it is a, a way to support all kinds of denial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things about this, uh, it, 2008 is when it kind of came to a head, although, again, it had been building up. Uh, that's not that long ago. Uh, and yet, it, it, it seems people are, are forgetting. I mean, um, it's certainly not talked about anymore. It's just, and just as we forgot about the great crash of 1929, mm -hmm. it, um, do you, I almost thought I'm going to get everybody I can to read that chapter so they remember, because uh, it wouldn't take much for it to happen again in some form, I would imagine. Well, and, you know, we did put in laws to try to get that yeah. industry under some control. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, the laws weren't as strong as they could have been, and they have been undermined, certainly in terms of their implementation during the Trump administration. And so, uh, yeah, we, we definitely need to keep an eye on this industry because I think there are a lot of people, even within the industry, who would say things are not, not secure, not necessarily that much better than they were. Yeah, yeah. You know, I wanted to ask you about, um, just, just really briefly as we move on to climate, um, climate change, climate denial, um, you did a chapter on um, you know, I'm not sure I have the right technical term. Chlor chloral CFOs, is it? The CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that, that's the ozone depletion chapter. Right. Um, so this is a um, this is a product that was um, often used in spray cans, and uh, and it was demonstrated factually that it was pl uh, putting a hole in the ozone layer. The reason I want to just ask ask you to just talk briefly about that was this seemed to have a fairly good, or at least partially good outcome, um, whereas actually science and knowledge and a lot of you know organizing and, and, and pressure led to uh, eventually a cutback on that activity, but also an international accord, uh, the Montreal Accord, an international agreement uh, to uh, regulate um, this substance. Could you just, um, and I wanted to mention that because it happened under Ronald Reagan, or at least part of it happened, and um, it shows that maybe we actually can occasionally as a world community come up with something positive. Yeah. Uh, what were some of your takeaways from that? Um, yeah, I, I've often thought that if, if space aliens landed on Earth and, and were sort of wondering whether humans could continue to you know, pursue our, our current path and, and survive the, the dangers we create for ourselves, we would mm -hmm. point to that and say, yeah, we created this terrible danger. Mm. Uh, and yes, the industry did deny it for quite a while. But eventually, there was mm. so much evidence that even the industry said, okay, we're going to stop making this product. Scientists got on board, the industry got on board, the, the global community got on board. And a president, President Reagan, who had, who had run on deregulation, mm. signed the Montreal Protocol, 
happy ending, right? And, mm-hmm. and it's going to take a while, but the ozone layer does appear to be healing. And, and so, mm-hmm. and, and all of those products were replaced. Mm-hmm. I mean, we still have some issues, but yeah. Um, but you know, that, that is a story that is the closest I can come up with to, <laughs> to a happy story. Yeah. And even there, I have to point out that it led to, or at least it was followed up very quickly by this, this sort of anti-science backlash that we saw emerging, even when the industry was like, fine, we're fine, we're moving on. You saw these right-wing free market groups coming forward and saying, you've been bamboozled to Congress and, and the science that you're relying on is wrong. And I think that this, this was part of a much larger campaign that, that certainly the tobacco industry played a big role in to try to undermine faith in, in government, in science, and certainly the kind of science that government relies on to regulate. Um, and that kept chipping away at it. I mean, this, you know, in 1986, the Tobacco Institute, this was already a, a joke, right? I mean, everybody mm-hmm. knew that they would just continue denying the risks of tobacco for forever, mm-hmm. regardless of the science. But in 1986, they came out with a report demanding that the Surgeon General be investigated for scientific censorship, um, uh, claiming that scientific integrity was at stake because the Surgeon General was saying secondhand smoke is a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, at the time, I think we probably all rolled our eyes and just thought how ridiculous, but that particular strategy where the industries don't necessarily increase their own credibility with the public, mm. but tear down the credibility of government and the institutions we have built and, and including, you know, the scientific associations, mm. mainstream media, that has continued and these, these nonprofit groups that were put together, you see the same groups questioning the science of of the tobacco's health impacts, questioning the science of ozone, questioning the science of climate change. Um, And and that of course gets me back to where I began. And Mm -hmm. and I did cross examine uh, some of these scientists who worked for these groups Mm -hmm. and you know, they, they took on lots of different industries and Mm -hmm. a lot of them sort of came at it with this sort of fierce anti-communist perspective and they were thinking that, you know, regulating these industries was just one step away from sending everybody to the gulag. And Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, just had a very strong ideological perspective and and clearly a financial stake Mm -hmm. in the sense that an industry, you know, will pay a lot of money to get uh, folks to, you know, folks who will testify on their behalf. Mm -hmm. And and so that brings us to climate change itself, which is something that... uh, really you've been working on and you're going to continue to work on. Um, it's it, One of the things that strikes me is maybe the largest example, at least since the slave trade, of a, a, ma- a mass movement of folks who are concerned about it uh, at, at the level of, of citizens uh, within the scientific community. And of course, um, political opposition uh, and corporate opposition uh, to change. Um, so I guess rather than go through all of that, um, uh, I mean, we literally have a, uh, two presidential candidates, one of whom says, this is real and we need to work on it, um, and another who's flat out denies it. What are your feelings about, uh, your thoughts about um, where we're at on this kind of epic struggle over acknowledging and then getting the political power necessary to do something about uh, yeah. climate Well, there's been a lot of progress in terms of changing public opinion. I mean, and not just in in overcoming denial, but in getting the folks who know this is real to be appropriately worried about it and to push for change. And and that is enormously helpful. And as somebody who's been working on this issue now for, oh, a quarter century, (laughs) (laughs) um, I can tell you that that is actually a a really good thing to see. Mm -hmm. Um, And we've seen lots of technological progress. So that's critical. I mean, the improvement in the prices and, and, and performance of renewables and storage and all those things, that's really, really good. So those two pieces are sort of in place. We get the politics in place in the sense mm. of making sure the right person wins this election um, and ideally the Senate. Mm. Um, and and we really can see things change mm. fast and they have to change fast. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we understand now that if we really want to try to control this mm. and keep warming under 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial, this is getting a little wonky, but basically it mm. means to, to be reasonably safe 
we need to reduce our emissions by about half in roughly the next decade. That's going to take a tremendous mobilization. Mm. But we now know from lots of analysis that we can do that with the technology that we have and in fact reduce people's energy bills and lead to a lot of other benefits, including lots of jobs. So we are either on the cusp of an amazing new era of, of transformation here, mm. or we're, we're going to sink more deeply into a period of tremendous turmoil, both political and climate. Mm -hmm. You uh, end uh, with, a, with a, you know, similar thoughts in your, your chapter, shifting the social norm toward the public interest. And even though in this conversation and in, in the book, you know, it focused a lot on these um, in corporate um, uh, denials and manipulation and tactics uh, in order to pursue, uh, pursue their interests and, and make their profit. Um, many of these stories also have to do with, with own awareness, a counter awareness and organizing uh, in opposition. Um, and I think you conclude with some um, positive ideas about how that might happen. Um, we, we live in, in an era of um, the post-truth era. We've all, you and I have talked about that a little bit, where in addition to all these stories, you know, we have this rampaging struggle over things like wearing face masks and Dr. Fauci and science, the, you know, the scientists versus, you know, in this case, our president and his supporters. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, post-truth post in general, but also as it relates to science um, and um, the credibility of, of science and, uh, and and where you see us headed in, in those kinds of questions. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I talked a little bit about, you know, the Tobacco Institute and, and mm -hmm. the uh, other non, the other industries that would fund these groups that would basically claim junk science and every, every time the industry every time any industry faced regulation practically. Um, and I really do think that that in many ways paved the path for uh, further fracturing of our society because you know we have built up these institutions over the centuries really science and, and, mm -hmm. and you know a, a scientific establishment in the sense of associations and societies and laboratories and universities and journals, the media, um, and obviously government, and, and they're all meant there to help us sort fact from fiction. Mm -hmm. Start going after all of those, which the industry has done and these right-wing group groups have done, and you leave people tremendously vulnerable to mm -hmm. these tribal appeals, yeah, and yeah. ideological appeals. People mm -hmm. get scared. People mm -hmm. get, at least they get paralyzed. They certainly mm -hmm. don't put together the momentum they need to do to work together to, to pass mm -hmm. laws and solve these problems. Mm -hmm. um, then you can have somebody like Donald Trump come along and be blatantly anti-scientific, mm -hmm. appeal to these more tribal mm -hmm. instincts, uh, tell them that you know these experts are just elites who are trying to exploit you, which is something that the fossil fuel industry has been claiming. Mm -hmm for a while now when it comes to climate change. Uh, and, and so, and of course, social media then makes it just that much worse. It becomes a way for us all to live in sort of different places, different parts of the internet, different channels on the cable mm -hmm. news and, mm -hmm. and avoid having a, a common reality. Um, I, you know, I, I am fairly um, comforted by the fact that it seems like no more than maybe 40% of our population yeah, is yeah. completely in, in denial when it comes to science and other issues. Mm -hmm. But clearly we have a lot of work to do. I mean, you mm -hmm. can look at social media as yet another industry mm -hmm. that is based mm -hmm. on fascinating discoveries, mm -hmm. causes inadvertent harm, profits mm -hmm. from causing that inadvertent mm -hmm. harm, mm -hmm. um, and maybe it's not so inadvertent once you've been profiting from it, uh, and then offers denials about that harm. Mm -hmm. And it's also a, a vector of disinformation for other industries. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. think what happens is society has to get together and figure out ways to deal with social media, to deal with broadcast journalism and, and other forms of disinformation and puts in place, you know, we have movements, we'll have litigation, we'll have research, uh, eventually, hopefully, we will have laws, and hopefully, that we will then build a, a larger body of trust uh, around new institutional pillars that that we, we can, you know, look to to help us sort fact from fiction and mm -hmm. and reality from manipulation. Yeah, that's that's well said. One of the things that comes through over and over again, not only in your book but just in what's happening. Um, 
as a former teacher myself, I would like to believe that um, by appealing to um, evidence and that rational uh, part of our brain, we, we can sit down and air our disagreements um, and uh, people will sort, sort that out based on a, on a kind of uh, a fact-based um, appeal. Um, but so much of how we process knowledge is, is through our identity. You speak about that, our tribalism, um, and that somehow in our strategies, strategies as, as folks who want to advance, uh, not just science as an abstraction, but an issue like climate, um, how, how do you do that when um, it's not simply a matter of who's got the better side of the evidence? How do you? Um, well, to... yeah, I mean, that's kind of unfair. Somehow, I'll try to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, somehow we have come pretty far in the yeah. sense of, of science did emerge and yes. people do care about evidence and science. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we build on that and, and keep moving and recognizing that we are emotional, tribal. Mm -hmm. uh, and and self-serving and biased in a lot of ways. And we yeah. use science to better understand our irrational side. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hopefully help us, you know, educate us and, and get us to the point where we're, we're not controlled by that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. How is uh, um, the book has been out for a while now? How, how is it being received so far? Uh, so far, so good. You know, it's hard to tell in a pandemic because I'm not <laughs> I know. conferences and speeches and book bookstore signings and whatnot um but the the feedback i've gotten has been has been quite good and nobody's threatened to sue me yet so that's good oh <laughs> uh, yeah wondering about that um <clears throat> well that's good and i do hope it gets out i really want to recommend it the book is um called um industrial strength denial eight stories of corporations defending the in indefensible from the slave trade to climate change it's a great book it's a great read um, and the stories themselves are compelling. And more than that, the ways in which you really uh, name and explain some of the ways all of us um, uh, can, can be in, uh, in denial and rationalize our behavior and sometimes try to avoid that dissonance that comes from something we're doing or a group in society is doing in, in the public good. Understanding those things um, is, is a major step forward. So I really appreciate you taking the time um, thank you for writing the book. Um, and, um, you know, let me know when you write another one. Uh, oh, well, I will, Tom. Thanks so much for having me. I've okay. enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.